this now brings us uh, to the lightning talk session in, in our program. The, we have uh, two tracks running in parallel. Uh, one track will stay right here in this meet, and you can see it, the, uh, the list of speakers here on, on this slide. As you see, we have seven short talks today. Each speaker has eight minutes. We're going to give you a heads up two minutes prior to end in the chat box, so please keep an eye. And we're going to start with Andreas from the University of Pennsylvania. So thank you so much for having me. Um, so um, I want to tell a little bit about uh, the work that we've been doing on uh, privacy preserving federated analytics with really, really large uh, user bases. And this is joint work with lots of people here at Penn. So next slide, slide number two. Right, so the scenario that we're interested in Actually, the next one after this scenario. So the scenario we're interested in is one where um, we have a truly massive number of devices. So think something like um, you know millions or even billions of devices. Think like the, the current Chrome deployment, more than two billion devices. And so each device has some local information that is sensitive. Like for instance, the location that the user has been to, or the words that the user has typed. And so our goal is really to answer uh, queries about this data in the aggregate. Um, uh, with the help of potentially like a, a central aggregator. And examples for that, for instance, would be predictive typing, right? So if you wanted to, you know, train a, a predictor based on like some prefix that the user has typed to suggest words that they might be uh, trying to type. And this is obviously very sensitive, like, you know, the words that you're typing into your phone. So we want to give very strong privacy guarantees, uh, particularly differential privacy. All right, next slide. So, you know, you can ask, you know, why is this hard? And there's sort of three things that we really want out of this. One is uh, we want high accuracy of our answers. We want to scale to really large numbers of users, like millions or billions. And we want to have a, only a single untrusted aggregator. And if, it turns out if you want only two of those three things, then we sort of know what to do, right? So if you uh, don't care so much about millions and if you're okay with like tens of thousands of users, you can use fancy crypto like FHE. Um, if you're okay with a fairly substantial amount of noise in your data, you can use a local differential privacy. And if you're okay with recruiting additional aggregators, like if you want to pair up with Microsoft or with uh, the EFF, then there are also any trust solutions um, that you can use. But the question is, can we can we really get all three? So next slide. So we've been working in this space for a while. Like we've looked at um, query languages, for instance, for differential privacy. Looked at query processing uh, solutions, and more recently, we've tried to find solutions for this scenario. And the first system that we that we came up with uh, is called HoneyCrisp. Uh, was SSP two two years ago, it was really a point solution for the particular problem that I motivated earlier, where like we wanted to know predictive typing um, solutions. Um, but that was really only like for that one scenario. A year later, we came up with a system called Orchard that really supports a, a, an entire range of queries. So it has a little query which can write what you want to know, and will then sort of answer that for you in, in the setting. And you can do queries like means, logistic regression, PCA, and so on. And then in this year's SOSP, we have a system called Mycelium. And so Mycelium generalized this uh, solution to graphs, but the graph itself can be private. So imagine trying to track the spread of infectious disease based on the COVID tracing graph, for instance. Next slide. So the high level, so I don't have time to explain exactly how this works, but at the high level, the way that we do it is we, we try to avoid the expensive crypto whenever we can, right? So we uh, take your query and we try to rewrite it in a way that we can use most or all of it, uh, can answer most of all of it using uh, cheap crypto, like uh, additively homomorphic crypto, for instance, um, and still get the global differential privacy piece that we, that we want. And we we're proposing a slightly different threat model. So it's common to assume, for instance, that up to like a third of your user base can be malicious, but it seems a bit pessimistic. Right? So if you have a billion users, even having like a botnet with 10 million users, only 1% of your user base. And so that gives us some more power. And then finally, um, we're trying to keep the plain text data away from the aggregator whenever we can. Um, so we're trying to, um, like, a, so we're choosing, using sortition to choose committees of user devices to hold shards of the cryptographic key material. Um, and then we work on encrypted data whenever we can. And at the end, this committee um, noises and then decrypts only the final result. Next slide. So to quickly look at um, how this might work, in Mycelium, it's like the analyst submits a query to our system. The system rewrites this query into one it can answer. In this case, like one that has a global uh, part and a local part. Um, and then it chooses a committee of user devices to, to, um, to generate the key material. And then each user device sort of so it's the first part of the query, the local part, with its direct neighbors in the graph. Um, and then in this case, the aggregator only works sort of as an intermediary to, to enable a communication in a privacy-preserving uh, privacy way. And in the second stage, you know, each device uploads its intermediate result to the aggregator, which aggregates it. And then the user device, uh, the, uh, the committee, um, 
uh, noises, the final result, and, and then uh, decrypts it and releases it. So that's roughly sort of how these pieces uh, fit together. And we actually, uh, the, the example application that we have for this is uh, like just the, the uh, infectious diseases, like you know, the contact tracing graph. Next slide. So, so this is what we where we are, right? So the systems that we that we have. Um, where are we going next? Uh, we want to broaden the, the range of queries that that we can answer, right? There's a lot of things we can do, but there's even more things that we don't yet uh, know how to do. And if you have a good query or a good use case in mind, then please come talk to me or, or send me an email. I would love to hear from you. We also want to work on, on the deployment, right? So right now these techniques have a bit of um, um, substantial overhead, and so we want to bring that down and also look at things like a churn or um, um, various kinds of attacks that we can defend uh, against. And once again, like if, if you think a technology like this could work for you, um, but there are things that we need to work on, please come talk to me and, and let us know what you what you need. And then finally, we, there are ways that you can use the scale sort of not just as a challenge, but also to your advantage. And so we want to look at that as well, to help sort of use the scale to help with the, with the computations. OK, so next slide. So I want to end with a shameless plug, right? So we um, we have these techniques, but um, we'd love to hear from you. Like if you have interesting use cases, um, if you think you can use this technology, and but there are also the challenges that you still need us to work on, uh, uh, please do um, uh, come talk to me. And so my contact information is is on the slide. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Andreas. I actually have a few questions, but I wanted to make sure we can take questions from others. If there is okay. any, anyone wants to ask Andreas questions. All right, maybe I'll go first. Mm -hmm. Anybody wants to jump in, Marco? Yeah, was, thank you, Andreas. Uh, can you say a little bit more about the the, the committee, uh, how it's formed, uh, how you make sure that it doesn't uh, lead to potential compromises and the overhead on the committee? Right, right. So the committee. Uh, so the the challenge is that the committee really has to be chosen uniformly at random because if the if there's a malicious party that can bias the selection of committee members towards their confederates, then we can easily. Uh, um, lose the privacy guarantee. And so we use cryptographic sortition for that. So it's a, the, the actual uh, technique is probably too complicated to explain here, but we, we are very careful to make sure that um, so there's, there's randomness involved and that and nobody can bias that randomness and that everybody can verify that the members of the committee can uh, are, are chosen uh, correctly. And then uh, the overhead on the committee is higher simply because uh, Basically, what they have to do is they have to choose the, the, the keys randomly. And right now, we're doing that with multi-party computation, which is a sort of garden variety uh, approach. And that's that's fairly expensive. But we're looking into um, sort of custom key generation protocols um, for, for, for this setting. And that should bring the overhead on the committee down quite a bit. Thank you. I wanted to ask uh, a quick question. So you mentioned local differential privacy. Um, are you getting good accuracy with local DP, or are you using some of the amplification via secure aggregation, shuffling type primitives? What model of DP are you operating under? Right. So uh, sorry for the confusion here. So the, the model that we want is global differential privacy. And the way that we can uh, defend that is really that um, we, we, we can afford to noise the data only proportional to a single user's data because it's all sort of encrypted, right? You're never going to see the data that a single user uploads, right? So we get global differential privacy in this model, and we don't have to uh, deal with LDPs uh, considerably high on noise. All right, Audrey has a question. I'm sorry, Audrey. Can you post the question in the chat box? Hopefully, Andreas can uh, respond in the chat box. We can all also have discussions mm -hmm. over the chat box. So sure. moving on, next slide, please. Uh, we have Li Xiong from Emory University. Li, the floor is yours. Thanks, Peter. Andreas, you talk so fast. I wish I could talk that fast. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity to present. So today, I want to briefly introduce two of our recent works, one addressing heterogeneous data, one addressing heterogeneous differential privacy requirement for federal learning. And both are for the cross-silo federal learning settings, which is uh, different from the cross-device, the very large-scale setting that Andreas talked about. So here, each institution or client holds a set of horizontally distributed data. And um, this is also joint work with my students and colleagues at Emory and other universities. Next slide, please. Thanks, Peter. So heterogeneous data or non-ID data is important and common problem in cross-silo federated learning. And we looked at the less studied graph data, which presents additional challenges since the heterogeneity can be pre present in both node features and link structures. 
So we're focusing on the graph classification problem where each client holds a set of graphs and the goal is to classify an individual graph, whether it's a molecule, whether it's an enzyme or not enzyme, um, its molecular property and so on. The question we want to answer is, can real world graphs from heterogeneous sources benefit from learning uh, from each other? So we analyzed the graphs from different domains and confirmed that they indeed share certain graph properties such as node degree distribution that are statistically significant compared with random graphs, which shows there's indeed benefit in applying federal learning to enable these cross data set, cross um, domain, cross institution graph learning. Next slide, please. However, we also find that different sets of graphs, even from the same domain or same data set, can have varying degrees of heterogeneity in both graph structures and node features, as the table shows. And also to see if it helps to train a joint model from different data sets, we used proteins as one data set and paired it with other data sets from the same or different domains with varying degrees of structure heterogeneity and then train a joint model. Turns out the accuracy on one graph the protein data set can indeed benefit from adding another graph, um, which shows the benefit of these cross data set cross domain federal learning. However, as the heterogeneity becomes too large, the performance degenerates, which means careful handling of this heterogeneity is needed, which also motivates our design of the clustered federal learning approach for the graphs. Next slide, thanks. So the approach is basically based on the CFL or the clustered federal learning, a multi-task learning based framework. In our setting, each client holds a set of graphs and submit the gradients for graph neural networks. And the basic idea is to cluster the clients into a set of clusters based on their model updates and then perform cluster wise federal learning. So we theoretically show that the model updates or gradients can capture the feature and structure heterogeneity and the clustering can reduce this heterogeneity. However, next slide, thanks. We observed that the gradients of the graph, um, uh, the graph neural networks to be rather fluctuating over different communication rounds as the figure shows. So this kind of affects or impedes the high quality clustering. So we designed the GCFL plus, which is an enhanced version where we use a series of gradients over consecutive communication rounds instead of one single round, then cluster them based on the dynamic time warping similarity. So next slide, thanks. Here are some sample results for both single data set multi-client setting and multi-data set multi-client setting. And the basic uh, messages GCFL and GCFL plus uh, outperforms the baselines, federated averaging and fed prox, which uh, does handle the data and system heterogeneity in non-graph FL. Next slide. And this one shows that the heterogeneity of the features and the uh, structures, they are indeed reduced because of the clustering. So the dashed line shows the heterogeneity before clustering. The blue and yellow shows the structure and feature heterogeneity within each cluster after the clustering. And they are indeed reduced, which contributes to the better performance of the approach. Next slide. So that's the heterogeneity in data. Another type of heterogeneity is the privacy requirement. Um, basically, existing work, mostly with differential privacy, um, assume a uniform privacy budget for user level or record level differential privacy. And then each client will use DPSGD to perturb the updates before submitting them to the server. And composition theorems are used to accumulate the privacy budget for the communication rounds. Now, in practice, in some of the applications, for example, the medical domains we work with, it's fairly common to have different privacy requirement for different institutions because of the privacy policies and different um, uh, user subjects who have different preferences and different consents and so on. So as shown here, each client can specify its own privacy budget and some may be more restrictive than others. So if we use federal averaging, it will treat them the same and does not differentiate or consider the different noisy levels of the different cl clients. And a simple and intuitive approach may be weighted averaging, where we can just set weight to be proportional to the privacy budget, meaning the higher the budget, the less noisy of the updates, and then they contribute more to the global average. However, the average may be dominated by these public or the clients that have very high privacy budget. So the challenge is really how to utilize the information from the less noisy updates, but without being dominated by them and biasing the final global model. So this motivates our approach. Uh, next slide, thanks. 
the projected federal averaging. This is mainly inspired by the observation in the current work, in the existing work, that the stochastic gradients usually stay in a much lower dimensional subspace along the training trajectory, trajectory of SGD. So we did an empirical study in the federal learning setting with a noisy update. And we indeed observed that the noisy model updates also live in a very small space. As this figure shows, there's a very small fraction of the eigenvalues that's much larger than others if we do the eigen decomposition of the updates. So this motivates us to propose a projected federated averaging approach. And the basic idea is simply to use the public clients who have less restrictive privacy budgets to extract the subspace and then just project all the updates um, from all the clients on this subspace before averaging them. And the intuition is that this low dimensional subspace could better leverage the information from the public clients without biasing or dominating others. Next slide. Thanks. So here's a quick framework where we just first partition the clients into two clusters based on their privacy budget or specifications, public and private. And then the clients submit their updates and the server conducts the projection using the subspace extracted from the public clients. And in this case, the clients still submit full updates, which incurs the usual communication overhead. Next slide. So a natural idea is, since we are using projection, a natural idea to make this more communication efficient is to have the clients or the private clients only submit the projected updates on the subspace, while the public clients can still submit their full updates so the server can extract the subspace um, and broadcast it to the clients to use in next round. So our experiments show that this provides significant communication overhead uh, reduction. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe there's like animation, I guess. <laughs> Just a heads up, we have one minute left. Thank you. So here are some sample results showing the accuracy with respect to the number of iterations for the two different data sets and different number of clients. The purple line is the non-private, uh, which serves as a baseline or reference. And the turquoise is the one uses maximum privacy budget of all the clients, which serves also as a reference. And then we can see the PFA and PFA plus consistently outperforms the weighted averaging. So um, both of these work, well, the first work is published in Europe, and this work is under revision for VODB and we'll post it on archive. So if you have any uh, further interest, want to know more details, please feel free to uh, check them out and we would love to hear from you. And we are doing some ongoing work, for example, looking at how do we address both data heterogeneity and privacy heterogeneity, um, combining the clustering approach and the projection approach, and also how they in interact with other requirements such as efficiency and robustness. So with that, I would like to thank you and be happy to take any questions or comments, either now or offline. Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, we're actually running a little bit late, so I rec I would suggest that if anyone has questions to Lee, please post them in the chat box. There are questions to Andreas. Andreas is responding. So let's do this discussion over chat box. Sounds great. OK, thank you. Thanks. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. All right, so moving on, we have uh, a talk by Lun Wang from UC Berkeley, and he's presenting work with his advisor, Don Song. Next slide. Yeah, thanks, Peter, for the introduction. Uh, so Don cannot make it today, so I will represent her to give the talk. Uh, so our talk will uh, focus on federated feature selection. Uh, and this is a joint work with uh, my fantastic collaborators from HKUST. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so, so here's some high-level overview of our group's efforts in this area. So we are like, generally interested in decentralized data science. Uh, federal learning is an important component of that. We are also interested in multi-party computation, uh, automatic privacy regulation enforcement, blockchain data evaluation. So we would like to combine these uh, techniques to build a decentralized data and analysis platform that the users can easily use and uh, um, the data owners can also like obtain their data sovereignty back from uh, large companies. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, speaking back of the project, uh, so here is the motivation, federated feature selection. So we all know that features are of great importance to 
uh, your machine learning accuracy, right? So if you have bad features, uh, the accuracy will be uh, very bad. If you have good features, then your accuracy will boost a lot. And uh, in federated learning, there is uh, another advantage of using a smaller number of features, that is uh, communication, computation cost on your mobile devices. Uh, and also, if you use a smaller number of features, uh, some work shows that your uh, model will be more robust and uh, will have more a better generalizable uh, property. So one way to select features from a lot of features the system gives you is to uh, do correlation test between features and the target. So if uh, the result shows that this feature has very high correlation to your target, then you'd better keep it. If it is not, then you maybe you can throw it away. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, so we want to do this in a federated setting and we focus on the well-known chess square test. It is a correlation test that will tell you if two random variables are correlated or not. And uh, I don't want to introduce uh, the, the, the formula of chess square test. Uh, the only thing I want to um, introduce here is chess square test can be rewritten in the form of a sum of squares. And uh, this uh, this has exactly the same format as second frequency movements. So now we recast the problem to uh, estimating uh, second frequency movements in a federated setting. And also we want to preserve some kind of security and privacy during this process. Uh, and the one challenge here is uh, second frequency movements is not a linear uh, statistics, so it cannot be easily used together with techniques like secure aggregation. Um, so what we would want to do is we would want to uh, approximate second frequency moments uh, using only linear updates from the clients. Uh, next slide, please. So, so we leverage this uh, GL transform. So what it says is if you sample uh, two variables from, two uh, from a standard normal distribution and you scale uh, the two random variables with A and B and sum them together, then the result random variable will still follow a normal distribution. And the scale of that normal distribution will be the square root of the second frequency moments of A and B. So using that fact, we can embed the second frequency moments information in the scale of a normal distribution. So what now the server needs to do, I, I, I will not go through the, the details of the algorithm, but from a high level, what the server will do is it will sample a lot of random variables from a standard normal distribution and uh, broadcast it to all the clients. What the client will do is they will multiply these random variables with their local data, sum them together and uh, upload this thing to the server. The server will further use secure aggregation to, to sum all these local updates. And uh, the result uh, will be a random variable following this normal distribution whose scale has the information about second frequency moments. So now you only need to estimate the scale of this distribution to get the information you want. And coming up the stack, we just go down. Now you can do federated chess square test securely, and now you can do uh, federated feature selection securely. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, actually, you can skip this one. This is an example. There's some uh, animations. <laughs> okay, so uh, actually we can we can not only do uh, second frequency moments, we can do uh, alpha frequency moments. Uh, so there is a more general version of GL transform called stable projection uh, proposed by India in his well celebrated paper. Uh, so so this so so. The, the, the core component is a class of distribution called stable distributions. And uh, if you scale two random variables from a alpha stable distribution and sum them together, the, the result scale will, will follow something like in the formula. It will be uh, the alpha's root of the sum of uh, the, the, the alpha's power of these values. So you can estimate actually alpha's frequency movements uh, in federated setting using this method. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, 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 so now we only like uh, guarantee that it can be used with segregation. So only some aggregate information will be revealed to the server. Uh, but this this method itself does not preserve differential privacy, and we are still working on that. Um, so, so GL transform and stable projection 
uh, itself, we just prove that if the projection matrix itself is preserved secret, then it, it preserves differential privacy as is uh, in this paper. Um, but uh, in our setting, the projection matrix is broadcast to all the clients. Uh, so this uh, property does not hold. So we are still investigating like how we can uh, efficiently add differential privacy in this setting. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so, so here are some remaining challenges. Uh, so the first thing is this stable uh, distribution thing is a uh, continuous uh, distribution. So you need very high uh, precession encoding of it. Uh, so we are thinking if we can use a discrete version of it to reduce the communication cost. And uh, uh, also like I just mentioned, uh, we are thinking like how we can preserve the secret of this projection matrix to uh, provide differential privacy without adding additional noise. Uh, and uh, yeah, another thing is the differential privacy proof we have is only for the case when alpha is greater than zero and smaller than one. So we are like seeing if we can prove for other cases. And uh, I will uh, end the talk here uh, and I'm glad to take any questions. So first there's a question uh, for Lee on the chat box. Oh yeah, she just responded, thank you. Um, we do not have time to take questions, Lun, but yeah. anyone who has questions uh, for Lun, please post them in the chat box and we can continue to discuss. I want to also mention that Lun has a poster today, uh, so we can also discuss during the poster session. Thanks. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so next up we have uh, Florian from Google. Uh, Florian, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. So today I'll be talking about membership inference attacks and some work we've been doing with um, some colleagues here at Google on this topic. So the reason I guess people in this crowd might care about membership attack, membership inference attacks is because it's kind of just a, the simplest form of privacy attack you could think of for a machine learning model, just being able to tell whether a specific example was in the training set or not. There's very clear um, immediate connections between these type of attacks and differential privacy. And these attacks are, because of that, also uh, increasingly used as a way to sort of empirically measure or audit the privacy of um, machine learning models. And what we find in this work is that existing attacks are actually really not that great for doing this because they um, very severely underestimate the privacy leakage. Um, and this is due for multiple reasons in how these attacks are designed and how they're evaluated. Uh, next slide, please. So here, just to set the stage, this is kind of just your uh, a very standard um, membership inference attacks. Uh, the one difference we're going to do compared to most of the prior work here is we're actually going to take a reasonably good model. So we just trained the CIFAR-10 model um, to a high level of accuracy, like 93, 94% accuracy so this model is really not particularly overfit and the membership inference attack is kind of your standard one where you just look at the model's loss and sort of if the loss is um, particularly low you're going to say well this is probably a member of the training set and the way such attacks are usually evaluated is just by computing the accuracy of the attack in sort of a balanced data set so you give the attacker um, some examples that are members, some examples that are not members, and the attacker sort of has to guess which are which, and you look at the accuracy. And this, this attack gets like a 60% accuracy, which is much better than chance, which would be 50%. And so you might sort of conclude, okay, this attack is actually pretty good. It works. Um, it turns out that if you really want to evaluate whether this attack is actually able to identify confidently whether someone is a member or not, um, it doesn't really work. So what we plot here instead is the, the trade-off between the attack's false positive rate and true positive rate. And you see that if you want the attack to actually have a reasonably low false positive rate, um, it actually doesn't do any better than chance. So it completely fails at reliably identifying any members. And we find that if we, um, if we evaluate existing membership inference attacks this way, most of them don't actually do any better than chance in this sort of um, regime that we care about for, for a meaningful attack. Um, next slide. And so the, the core reason we find that existing attacks just don't really work is because they implicitly assume a kind of a uniform prior on how hard individual examples are. 
Um, so consider this example here. You have these two images of a cat and sort of a very noisy truck. Um, where most existing attacks, what they would do is they would look at the model's confidence on these examples, and they would have to say that the cat here on the left is a member because, or it's more likely to be a member of the training set than this truck because the model's confidence is higher. But this is, of course, not the right thing to do here because any reasonable model will have a high confidence on this cat because it's just a canonical image of a cat. Whereas this sort of very weird looking truck, it's maybe more surprising the way that the model has a high confidence here. Uh, next slide. And so what we do is we, we really sort of go back to first principles of what it means to design a membership inference attack, a sort of distinguishing between really the two cases where you have a model that was trained on a data point or not. Um, and so what we do here is that on a per example basis, we'll build a prior just by training a bunch of models of what the model's confidence should look like when it is trained on a particular example or not. And then based on that, we can build um, a likelihood test of um, what's more likely given given an observed loss that we that we measure with a with an unknown model. And so in this example, for instance, you see that um, for this cat image, kind of whether you train on this image or not, uh, um, any model is basically going to have very high confidence that this is a cat, and so you're not going to be able to do meaningful uh, membership inference. Whereas for the truck. Only a model that was trained on this image is going to have a reasonably large um, confidence, still much lower than for the cats. And so the, here you're going to have a much higher power in your membership inference attack. Next slide. And so basically, we use this type of um, per example prior idea and combine this with a whole bunch of other tricks, um, many of which have actually appeared in the literature in the past years, but were sort of never really combined in this way or evaluated um, in the way that we suggest. And so what you see here is that this new attack that we propose performs orders of magnitude better than this sort of baseline uh, membership inference attack that we started with. And that's now we've actually moved to a plot that's on a log scale. And so we now have an attack that even at extremely low false positive rates um, is able to confidently identify some members of the training set. And so this is a much, much stronger attack against privacy um, than the attack that we started with. What's also important to note here is that if you actually just compute the accuracy of both attacks, um, they're fairly similar. And so again, this kind of shows why accuracy is just not a particularly good measure um, for the um, success of a membership inference attack and that really looking at how, they, how these attacks behave at low false positives is what we should be doing. Um, next slide. So yeah, to conclude on this, um, I think we have to be very careful in how we evaluate um, attacks on privacy and that depending on what measure we use for the evaluation, we're going to get very, very different insights into what kind of attacks work and which, or what kind of techniques work and which ones don't. And what we find is that if we really focus on this evaluation at low false positive rates and we use the right kind of techniques uh, from the literature, we can actually get um, better attacks that really work at identifying members. And um, so if, you've, if you use membership inference attacks to audit machine learning models for privacy uh, or to estimate differential privacy parameters or these kind of things, you should really switch to um, these much, much stronger attacks because existing attacks are just going to um, lead you to very severely underestimate how much privacy leakage uh, exists in your models. Uh, yeah, thanks, that's all for me. So we'll have a paper written up on this uh, shortly. So hopefully then you can, if you're interested, you can see um, all of the details. Thank you, Florian. There's uh, a question actually from Amir um, about, uh, you know, he's wondering if how much costlier your training process would be for the attacker. So if you can comment on the uh, cost, the computational cost of these attacks. Yeah, so the the most um, the sort of most direct attack we consider is quite costly because it requires sort of training a bunch of models to compute a good prior. Um, 
we have some some experiments that sort of look at at how uh, this cost um, affects or sort of what the trade off is between how well the attack works and and uh, and the cost of the attack. We find that even even by training, say, two or three surrogate models, you can get an extreme uh, an attack that performs extremely well. Um, and so the, the overhead of the attack, if you can amortize it over many many samples that you try to predict membership of. Is not is not that bad. We can take one more question. Um, so Auntie asks, uh, you should look at average precision for evaluating attacks. It focuses more on the low false positive rate regime. Do you have any? Yeah. Comments? So we looked we looked at at some uh, measures like precision and recall or area under curves, so average precision. Um, so average precision, I'm actually on the top of my head, not sure exactly what it computes. Um, what we what we kind of want to avoid here in terms of metrics are metrics that that sort of aggregate over the entire range of false positive rates, like uh, something like the AUC would do, because this again focuses on on an entire sort of parameter regime that you don't really care about for a for a meaningful attack. Um, so I, I'm not. Uh, oh yeah, on the top of my head, I don't. I don't know what average precision measures, but uh, yeah, I'll look into this. Thanks. Sounds good. I'm also interested in knowing how these attacks can be applied in the federated setting. How can you like remove a client, keep a client, or something like that? So maybe we'll continue to discuss over the chat box. There's plenty of good Sounds questions. Good. So Florian, please uh, try to address those questions. Uh, next, we have Chuang Song from Google. Chuang, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm going to talk about our project on public data assisted mirror descent for private model training. I'm Sean, and this is for a uh, joint work with uh, many people. Uh, so Aron is from UC Berkeley, Manit is from MIT. They intern at Google uh, when we're working on this project, and the rest of the authors are Googlers across different teams. Uh, next. Um, so first, we consider the PSGD and the geometry of optimization. So suppose we have a loss function f across some private data and the gradient g of f. So what the first private SGD will do um, to update the model is basically it will apply a, a g plus some Gaussian noise and then multiply that with uh, eta, the learning rate. So a potential pro problem here is that though this Gaussian noise we add is isotropic, the loss function might not be. So the noise can be suboptimal. Next. Thank you. So this can be reflected in the excess empirical risk. So compared to the non-private learning, which uh, doesn't have dependency on the dimensionality, DPSGD would have a dependency on D, the model dimensionality. And here epsilon is the privacy parameter and N is the number of examples. So this square root D term can be significant for large models. For, uh, for example, in practice, it's hard for us to get accuracy higher than 70% for CIFAR 10 with good privacy, while the non-private model can easily get up to 90. Next. Um, so the question people have been thinking of is to use non-isotropic noise that better matches the optimization geometry. For example, one of the prior work clip gradient to ellipsoid instead of bar and add noise according to the ellipsoid. So in this way, model dimensionality D will be replaced by some term depending on that ellipsoid, which can become constant in the best case. So how do we know this ellipsoid? The paper proposed to use public data from potentially the same or similar distribution as the private data to learn it. And this is also some other work and also what we are going to assume in our project. Uh, next. Um, so motiv <clears throat> motivated by the fact that gradient nearly lie in some low dimensional subspace, another past work look at using public data to learn a lower dimensional subspace to project the gradient onto. So they can get down the empirical risk from D to K the, um, the, um, if the subspace is learned correctly. So, uh, but the problem is that when learning the geometry with public data, um, all this prior work introduces more proper parameters. So the process of using public, public data is not fully automatic. So what we are trying to achieve is to see if there is a way to use the public data to assist private learning in a more automatic way. Uh, next. 
So um, the algorithm we consider is to use mirror descent. So what is mirror descent? I'll talk about uh, this part is like the non-private mirror descent. So um, consider there's two optimization problem again. So gradient descent would take different path because these two problems, they have different geometries. So it will be converging directly to the optimal in the left case, but it will bouncing a little bit on the right case. Uh, next. So, so people created mirror descent to reshape the gradient so that the right case become easier. So suppose we have a function psi that captures the geometry of the optimization. We can define some distance function such that this point x and, x and y on these two plots, um, though they have different distance under the usual metric in these two functions, uh, under this new distance function, they will have the same distance. So in this way, the non-isotropic problem will look isotropic under this distance metric and will be converging faster. Uh, next. So uh, what does this mirror descent do uh, exactly? So first we look at a uh, uh, like a gradient descent. So in gradient descent, what we do is first we initialize the model, and for each round, we will sample a batch, compute the gradient, and then update our model with the gradient multiplied by some learning rate eta. Uh, next. And uh, so another way to look at this update step is that the new, new model eta is the solution to this problem eta equal to eta t minus, um, sorry, uh, the model theta. So the, uh, the theta is uh, equal to theta t minus eta times g, where uh, 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 so this problem is, of course, trivial in this case. Uh, next. So, so mirror descent is simply achieved by replacing this model theta with the function psi applied to theta. Uh, yeah. So as is illustrated in this figure, by doing so, we are reshaping the gradient so that it moves faster in the horizontal direction. So the optimization path go from the solid uh, to the dashed line and the convergence is faster because we are uh, having less bouncing around. Uh, next. So now uh, we've been talking about the original non-private mirror descent. So how do we do uh, use it in our case? So what we propose is to use the loss function on the public data to define our psi function. And of course, our gradient here is the private gradient. And additionally, notice that in the first line, to take full advantage of the public data, we will be warm starting our model theta zero by pre-training on the public data. Uh, next. Uh, so in this way, our empirical loss would become square root d over epsilon times uh, square root n pub times uh, times n prime, where n pub and n prime are the number of public and private samples. So in this way, we can see that if we have n pub in roughly of the order d, then we'll get a bound that is independent of of, of model dimensionality. So compared to the original DPSGD loss without public data, this can be a significant gain if d is large. Um, next. So as a summary, our algorithm can use the data to uh, in a more automatic way and does not need low run assumption compared to prior work. And our bound also degrades smoothly with respect to the number of public examples. Um, next. So in the end, uh, I'm going to show some pro um, uh, experimental uh, results on synthetic and real data to examine the effectiveness of our algorithm. So first, we uh, on linear regression, we uh, vary the dimensionality d from 500 to 6,000. And for each d, we will generate 10k private samples and 1.5d public samples. So the number of public samples is of the order uh, d. And to generate non-isotropic feature vectors, we will be randomly selecting 40 of the first d over 5 um, features and 80 of the last 40 over 5 features to set them to 0 0.05 and set the rest as zero. So in this way, the auto norm of the feature vector and um, enter the gradient is going to be dimension independent. And also we assume there is some inherent noise in this, um, in this target. So the population means where arrow is the same as the noise. Oh, next. So um, apart from our proposed algorithm, there are two baselines we consider. The first is code start DPSGD, which means we run DPSGD only on private data, and warm start means we retrain on public data. So what we can see is that on the left-hand side, uh, the warm start can uh, outperform code start significantly and uh, almost achieve a um, dimension independence. 
And on the right hand side, we can see our algorithm is even better than the work start to get you uh, next. Um, so now we look at some real data. So first we made some small modification in the algorithm to make it more efficient. So uh, basically we're going to use this update rule where the uh, right part is the noisy um, private gradient and the blue is the public gradient. And R5 is a coefficient balancing these two terms. So in experiment, we're going to decrease R5 with a cosine schedule. And there are three data sets we look at. On each of them, we assume 4% 4, 4 of the public data, 4% uh, of the data is public. Next. Um, so on um, each of the data set, we look at the training trajectory um, in terms of the test loss and also the test accuracy for the two image classification data set. So what we can see, uh, so the uh, blue line is our algorithm and the other two are the warm start and cold start DPSGD. So what we can see is that our algorithm always outperform um, the baseline in terms of the loss and it also outperform the baseline uh, in terms of the accuracy in some cases. Uh, next. So as a summary, we propose a mirror descent based algorithm that use public data to help private training and it has good theoretical guarantee that can get dimensional independency, uh, independent bounds when we have a number of public data in the order of D and also a good uh, empirical result. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chuang. Uh, we actually ran over time, so we cannot take live questions, but please post your questions in the chat box for Shuang. Steven has a question actually already for Shuang. So Shuang, please <laughs> try to, uh, take questions in the chat box. Uh, next, we have Steven Wu uh, from CMU. Steven, the floor is yours. Thank you. I guess I should not use my time to ask questions. Hi, I'm Steven. It's great to be here. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a uh, next. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, two of my CMU colleagues, uh, Shen Yuan Hu and Virginia Smith. Uh, Shen Yuan is a lead uh, student in this work. Next slide. So uh, in this work, we mostly want to think about the problem of multitask learning. Uh, so they're usually broad, two broad categories of uh, multitask learning or MTL that somehow correspond to the two, roughly two categories of federated learning. Uh, one is sort of like the kind of model personalization uh, where we design one model for each person. Uh, and but in the earlier days, when people think about MTL, they often think about what we now call the cross-silo settings, where you train different models, one for each of the organizations. Next slide. So in this work, we mostly uh, focus on the personalization setting, where we have uh, a lot of users, and we would like to have a single model for each user. Uh, so in this case, in, in language of multitask learning, each task correspond to building a personalized model for each user. And the goal for our work is to achieve task level or user level differential privacy uh, in, when solving multitask learning. So uh, for whatever the amount of data a user have, we would like to provide some sort of strong uh, differential privacy-like guarantee. Uh, so in short, uh, we, I think we have two main contributions in our, our work. One is really think hard about what should be the privacy formulation for this type of setting of MTL. So uh, we realize it actually makes a lot more sense to, to think about this slight relaxation of differential privacy called joint differential privacy. And under this idea or notion of joint differential privacy, which was quite popular in thinking about game theory and privacy, we also designed federated MTL algorithms uh, under this uh, slightly relaxed version of DP. Next slide. Um, next slide, maybe you have a couple of times, yeah. One more, I guess. Uh, okay, so uh, I guess this session is really about, a lot of work is about differential privacy, so I assume much of the audience are familiar with this. So just a quick recap, right? Uh, the idea of differential privacy is that if you change one person's data in a data set, for example, Alice's data to Bob's data, uh, click one more time, sorry. Uh, you wanna expect that the, the Output distribution by the algorithm is not changed by much. So, uh, what is what? How should we think about the output distribution in the in the case of MTL? Uh, next, and one more. <laughs> so, uh, the the first exercise we we begin with is to think about well, if you want to apply differential privacy to the setting of MTL, it becomes a little strange, right? Because the most natural way to think about the output of the algorithms will be the entire collection of personalized models to all the users, 
So on the left side, you have all the users' private data as input. At the right side, you have all the personalized models for all the users as output. So if you just apply the idea of differential privacy just in the most straightforward way to this setting, it would impose the requirement that the entire set of personalized models is insensitive to any single user's data. And it feels a little weird because if I change the first person's data into someone else's data, uh, it will also imply that um, thanks, uh, the, the first model is remain roughly the same, even though the person's uh, preferences and the private data uh, are now completely different. Uh, next slide. Um, next. So I put too many animations here. <laughs> next. So, um, and this mismatch is so obvious that it basically suggests that maybe we should consider a slight variation of this idea of differential privacy. So one thing, one observation you can quickly make is that, well, you know, the, even though the entire output contains all the user's personalized model, uh, the user would not like necessarily release their own model, right? We would give them one model, one personalized model, the user would not actually announce it in any ways. What we would like to protect is, you know, the user's data from all the other users, right? So in particular, if we're training this model jointly by coordinating multiple users' data, during the communication, it could be that we, we are leaking uh, the first user's private data through communicating other, mo other personalized models to all the, all the, all the other users. Uh, next slide. Uh, click one more. Uh, yeah. So uh, a very meaningful relaxation one could think about is not to impose this kind of uh, differential privacy-like insensitivity on the entire collection of personalized models, but instead, we can think about the insensitivity on all the other output to, to all the other users except for the first person. Right? So uh, one example would be if we can require that all the output information revealed to all the other users except user one is insensitive to the change of users one's data, then we're essentially providing the strongest, the next best thing like differential privacy. Uh, next slide. So this idea, uh, next slide. So this idea is actually uh, early in the earlier days of uh, differential privacy is formulated as joint differential privacy. I personally, I'm not sure this is the best name capturing the idea, um, but here it goes, the ship has sailed. Uh, but if you're familiar with the, the notion of differential privacy, essentially is adapting the, the same idea of stability uh, in a more refined way. So if you have, think about two data sets that differ by the first person's data, and we only look at the information revealed to all the other users except the first person's data. So think about I equals one here. And you're only imposing the stability condition on the output to all the other users. So in this notation, we just use A, uh, a of D uh, minus I. Uh, so you know, there's a lot of work on joint differential privacy already. It's a very natural notion of privacy in game theory and mechanism design. And, and very strong implication of uh, joint differential privacy is that in the setting of federated learning, even if all the other users collude and share the information, like they, they talk together and try to figure out what user wants data look like, if the algorithm, if the protocol satisfies joint differential privacy, they will not be able to learn about users wants private data. So it's a very strong guarantee still. Next slide. So um, under this formulation, uh, we believe that you, know, you can actually think about broadly about many questions around uh, multitask learning, uh, especially relevant to design and federated learning algorithm. Uh, in our paper, we mostly focus on a particular formulation of mean regularized multitask learning, uh, perhaps is one of the earliest, earliest one and the simplest one, which is called mean regularized multitask learning. So here, just a little bit of notation, you have a model W sub K for every single user. Uh, at the same time, you want to maintain that uh, you act, not only you, you cater a, a single model to each user, but you also want to enable cross learning across different users' data. So one way to do that in mean regularized MTL is to actually make sure that uh, the personalized model for each one is not deviating from the average model for, uh, for all the users. Uh, and you can actually design federated learning algorithm that satisfy joint differential privacy uh, following a, a established protocol for designing a JD, JDP algorithm called the Billboard model. Next slide. 
Um, and uh, we also, also provide uh, uh, some uh, empirical evaluation on the algorithms. Uh, we particularly pick out uh, several standard data sets in which uh, we show that there is actually a benefit to think about doing multitask learning. So you know, if you only train one global model versus using mean regularized MTL, you actually can improve the accuracy. And, and we can also show that the, the private version of the algorithm actually improve as you gradually increase about level epsilon. Um, next slide. Uh, next. Yeah, so in summary, I think I think there are two main contributions, which I think one is the, the, the JDB privacy formulation if we think about uh, task level privacy in MTL and also uh, very simple federated MTL algorithm for solving this problem. Happy to talk more about this offline. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Stephen. We're also out of time. So there is a question from Aurelia on the in the chat box. So please handle questions in the chat box. Okay. Um, next, we are at the last talk for the lightning talk session by Satin Kale from Google. Satin, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, this talk was supposed to actually have been done by uh, Anandutirtha Suresh, but he is traveling it with with uh, kind of a flaky internet connection, so we asked me to give the talk. Um, so this this talk is on learning with user level differential privacy, and it's based on a couple papers that Tirtha has written, and one of which is in collaboration with me. Okay, next slide. All right. So the motivation here is, as usual, to learn uh, a good model or the distribution of the user data. And uh, we can consider that either in the standard centralized setting when all the data is actually uh, available at a centralized server or, uh, or actually more relevant to this workshop, we can think of it in the federated setting um, where data is actually distributed over different users. This setting was considered by uh, McMahon et al. in 2017. Um, obviously here users are contributing data which are sensitive. Uh, and so we would like to protect their privacy. And as in uh, almost all of the other talks in this session, we would will use differential privacy as the framework in which to cast our uh, privacy guarantees. Okay, next slide. All right. So again, this is probably you've seen this slide to the you know uh, several times now, but uh, just go over it one uh, one more time just to have the definitions clear because one aspect of this work is in the definitions. Uh, so uh, a typical centralized differential privacy uh, definition assumes that uh, every user contributes a single item to the data set. Uh, and then the requirement of differential privacy is that uh, whenever you have an algorithm operating on the data, the distribution of the output does not change very much if you if you changed any single user's item. So uh, so so in more formally, this is uh, given in the equation uh, bound given in the, in, on a slide. So if you have two neighboring data sets, by neighboring we mean data sets which differ in a single user's sample, uh, then a mechanism would be set to differentially private if the, out, the distribution of the output changes only by a multiplicative factor of e to the epsilon and additive factor of delta. Okay, so this is uh, this this uh, this is all nice uh, in the case of centralized privacy, uh, but when we have, when you're looking at the federated setting, uh, when we have users contributing multiple data samples, uh, this definition might be problematic. So next slide. Okay, so yeah, this is just a visualization. So, as an uh, as an example, if you're training a model for um, you know for uh, for next word prediction on the Google keyboard, every user has a bunch of their own local data, and then we want to um, we want to ensure that regardless of how any single user's data is changed, uh, the 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 model that is learned doesn't uh, differ by very much at a, at a high level. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we, uh, so the user level differential privacy was defined in this paper by McMahon et al. in 2016 as follows. So we say that uh, a mechanism, I mean, it, it's going to look similar to the item level differential privacy, but here we, uh, we, we, we require that the mechanism of printing on the data set output distributions that are close to each other within the multiplicative and additive factor as before, except that the, that the definition of neighboring data sets is now different. So we will say that two data sets are, um, are neighboring if if the, if the if the data of any single user uh, has changed. Okay, so so this is represented pictorially in these three different data sets on the slide. And um, uh, so so even though the first two data sets would be considered neighbors in the item level privacy, um, I guess Brendan has mentioned mentions that the the actual definition goes back much far, further. I wasn't aware of that. Um, okay, so. Uh, all three data sets would be considered neighbors. 
uh, in this in the, under under this definition. Uh, although, if you look at the first and the third data set, they wouldn't be considered neighbors in the in the standard item level privacy case. Okay, next next slide. Okay, so to formalize uh, the setting, we will assume that data is collected from n different users. Yeah, user U collects um, has n U samples that are drawn from a certain distribution P U, and we'll assume that at least in the paper we'll assume that all the distributions of the users are are similar, so they are within total variation distance of delta. Uh, although in this talk, just to, just to keep things simple, we'll assume that all the users have exactly the same distribution. So all of them are drawing samples from P, and, uh, and all of them have exactly the same number of samples, which is M. Uh, so in the paper, we provide algorithms, which uh, are at least differentially private mechanisms, where, whose privacy guarantees hold for all data sets, regardless of how they're sampled, even if they don't satisfy these closeness uh, properties. The utility guarantees, however, hold uh, only when the data sets are generated from the distribution P. Okay, next slide. Uh, we do consider a bunch of different problems um, in this area. So the, the, the sort of the, the canonical one is the mean estimation problem. So here we are given samples uh, drawn from a certain distribution over RD, and we want to estimate the expectation of this um, of this distribution. Um, another problem we consider is a discrete a distribution estimation where we are now given samples uh, over a discrete set of size k, and we want to estimate the 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 the, uh, the, the uh, probability mass over each sample. Uh, another uh, kind of broad umbrella that we consider is uh, stochastic convex optimization. Here we are uh, we are gonna, we, we are given samples x y drawn from a distribution, and a loss function l, which is uh, which is convex in the in the parameters of the hypothesis set. And we want to try to find the hypothesis which has the minimum expected test test loss. Um, we also consider a few other uh, few other problems such as empirical risk minimization and loss minimization over hypothesis sets with finite metric em uh, entropy. But I would I won't really mention them in this talk. Okay, next slide. Uh, okay, so uh, so it should be evident that user level privacy would incur a higher utility loss compared to uh, item level privacy simply because the definition of neighboring data sets is much broader so the uh, so so uh, so one question is whether you can just simply repurpose some of the item level privacy guarantees to get user level privacy guarantees and you can certainly do that however the utility guarantees degrade pretty significantly and the main question we considered in this work was how does the utility guarantee change as a function of epsilon delta and m Okay, next slide. Uh, the main theorem is that for all the problems that I mentioned in the previous slides, uh, we can come up with an algorithm such that the privacy cost actually scales as one over square root m. So it actually gets better and better as the user contribute more and more samples. Okay, next slide. Uh, more precisely, we have a, a certain number of utility, uh, okay, some uh, bounds that are listed on the slide. Uh, the main uh, thing to note here, uh, there's a lot of symbols, but the main thing to note here is that the the privacy cost, which is the second term in the utility guarantees uh, of our algorithm degrades, sorry, uh, actually gets better uh, as a factor of one over a square root m as, a, as m increases. Okay, next slide. Uh, we also have corresponding information uh, theoretic lower bounds, which, which, which match the upper bounds. Uh, and these are derived using techniques that were developed in the work of Acharya et al. in 2021, which developed differentially private versions of Fano's inequality and Oswald's inequality. Next slide. Uh, we also uh, have a, uh, uh, so it turns out that as M goes to infinity, uh, we don't actually have zero privacy cost. We do end up with a privacy cost still. Uh, this is a, like a separate result in our paper. Um, it's a little bit technical, but roughly speaking, if the, uh, if the delta parameter is small enough, uh, then for the mean estimation problem, we are essentially stuck with a certain amount of um, uh, error that is, that is uh, unavoidable. Uh, due to privacy concerns. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, so these are just the two papers which are which are uh, which are appeared. Well, one of them is going to appear in Europe this year, and one of them appeared in Europe last year. And I guess my time is up, but I can answer any questions if there's time. Thanks, uh, Sachin. Um, we're actually at time, but maybe we yeah. can take a quick question. Anybody wants to ask a quick question to Sachin? I, I wanted to ask about uh, 
the the you know the algorithms for the feasibility result. Did you compare them to the naive algorithms, things like so, just using Gaussian or something? Uh, so, what do you mean by feasibility? What is that? So, in order to get the root m gain, mm -hmm. the sample complexity. Oh, um, okay. So, if you if you just use like a standard Gaussian mechanism or a Laplace mechanism or something. Right. So we we find that I mean we, we can do that, but then the utility guarantees do degrade. So you don't get this one over square root m factor in the privacy cost. You just end up with d over n epsilon. Um, you have to do a little bit extra work. Um, you have to essentially the all of the algorithms are based on the fact that once you have independent samples, um, then uh, you can apply concentration of measure and uh, the the statistics that you need to compute are going to be concentrated with the standard deviation of square root m. And then you can essentially clip out anything that's beyond that uh, radius. That's like the high level idea. So you have to do a little bit extra, but but yeah, I mean, in the end, you we, we will we will apply um, a, a standard mechanism like Laplace or Gauss. Sounds good. Yeah, the, the reason why I ask is uh, my impression from at least the second paper. Uh, th these hold when epsilon is very small, the results, uh -huh. and they hide all the constants. The, the constants can be pretty bad. So I was just wondering if for a realistic epsilon, there was a comparison that was done on a data set and then, you know, we I see. see a gap between taking this approach versus the just like- Got it. Process. Yeah, we uh, like, yeah, we did not do any experiments to be honest. So this was a theoretical work, but um, but yeah, so I, I, so I, I don't know how to answer that question yet currently, but I, we can take it offline. All right, okay, cool. Thanks, right. thanks a lot everyone. Okay. This was a great session.